when I was trying to find out how to do this talk, I thought about one of the figures you've probably heard as breast cancer advocates, women affected with breast cancer, the men who love the women affected with breast cancer. Breast cancer impacts one in eight women. And I started to think about how shallow that statistic is. Because it's not like you're sitting at a table of eight and one of you is gonna get breast cancer and the other seven will always be safe because you sat on that table with the one woman who got breast cancer, so you're not gonna get it. And it's, it's, it's a false statistic only in so far as we are gathered in this room. It doesn't matter that eight women are at risk. It really matters when you are the one. When you are the one who's been diagnosed, when it's your mother, wife, sister, best friend, and that's why we're here, because we need to figure out what we can do for the one woman who's been diagnosed. And certainly, that was the case with my friend Christina. She was one of you. She and I met in college, um, and it was a friendship that lasted decades. I could go months without seeing her, and then pick up the phone, and it'd be like we were in college once more. So I knew she had a second child. I knew that child was still probably eight months when I got her phone call. And I thought it was just to talk about being a parent, and it wasn't. She had told me she was diagnosed with breast cancer, but she also didn't call me for the there, there, it's gonna be fine. She knew I did breast cancer research. She knows I, I was a clinician, so she wanted answers. She was determined to survive. She was determined to be a mother, to see her kids marry. And she was determined to finish her PhD. She did not want me to console her. She wanted me to advise her. And the first thing I told her is that we have an opportunity to cure you right now. Breast cancer does not kill because of a tumor in the breast. Breast cancer will kill because of what it does from there, where it spreads to the lungs, to the liver, to the brain. The mortality, though, from breast cancer isn't limited to just breast cancer itself. Banu sort of mentioned this already. We need to make sure that our therapies aren't killing you as well. Okay, so women die from more... <clears throat> women die from the complications of treatment, either acutely or in the long term. We don't want to give you heart failure when we're trying to cure you of your cancer. And women die of other things. But the mortality of breast cancer isn't from breast cancer. It's from the disease when it comes. So I told Christina, this is our best chance to cure you. So what have they recommended, and what else should we consider? As I thought about that case, I realized how much progress we've made. And Banu talked about genetics versus genomics. This is really about the genomics. This is beyond just the Human Genome Project. We are going into tumors today and trying to de de determine what makes that tumor tick. And this is an incredibly complicated figure of a cell line, the MCF7 cell line that we work with in the laboratory that is of breast cancer. What you're seeing is the chromosomes that are numbered, and you're seeing a lot of pretty colors of greens and reds. And all of those little lines and all those little marks are changes within MCF, MCF7. There are changes within each chromosome, and there are changes between the chromosomes. Herein, I think, lies the holy grail of how we save each and every one of your lives. Herein, we need to understand this figure and figures like it so much better. This is where the keys will come for control of cancer and of cure. We've already seen this impact us in a clinical way. This is a very old study now from 2000, but it's where we found out that breast cancer is not one disease. By looking at the genomics of a cancer, of multiple cancers, we saw that the, pink, the reds and the greens, they split. And they split into different types of tumors. And not only did they split, they split prognostically. So now we talk about luminal tumors, which are hormone positive. We talk about HER2 tumors, and we talk about basal-like breast cancers. And this is just the tip, because even within basal-like breast cancers, we're finding out those aren't just one tumor. There are different types you might hear about in the future. Claudin-Low, interferon-rich. 
So we're finding out that breast cancer is as heterogeneous as the people in this room and finding out how to make sense of that and how to provide that knowledge into action is where we are going next. How we're gonna get there is here. This is not one slide of what we are gonna do clinically in research. This is a slide of evidence-based medicine and the importance of the slide for this room, and please carry this forward, evidence doesn't come from one part of our equation. We are not gonna determine from the medical centers across this country and the comprehensive cancer centers what that evidence entails because it's going to have to be put through experts who are knowledgeable in how to treat women with breast cancer and they need to be informed by your goals and your preferences. So when you see those studies come out and those little bullets of research that make the popular press, it's important to understand four things. What's the population? that was being studied. What did they try to do? What did they compare it to? And what outcome are they talking about? It's a nomenclature we use in evidence-based medicine or EBM called PICO. It's the PICO standards and it's something that I want to just bring for this group because it's important not only for us in clinical research but for patients and also for people who are going to make the policies that determine what drugs we can use to treat each and every one because we must use these PICO standards as we try to go forward. And again, this is a nice segue from Dr. Arun's talk because we talked about prognostic testing. So we want to know, and you always want to know from us, what's my risk of death? What's my risk this is going to come back? Those are prognostic tests, and quite frankly, my opinion, I'm done with prognostic tests because it helps me. It's not going to help me help you to know that you're at high or low risk. What I want is in the second set there. I want predictors. This is where we need to go. I want to know, your tumor is HER2 positive. I need to give you HER2 directed therapies. I want to know, you have a, C a CDK pathway mutation. I want to give you palbociclib. I want to know, what will predict all of these drugs will work in which one of my patients? And then I want to know, how can I use it more safely? How can I use it? By studying this tumor, how can I use these drugs so that I don't kill you? Those are pharmacodynamic tests. And all three of them are simultaneously going on today, but they're different. These are already happening. The trials are on process. One of the ones that is probably the most important to this audience is the iSPY trial. Investigation of serial studies to predict your therapeutic response with imaging and molecular analysis. <laughs> kind of cheated there in the end, but it's the iSPY trial. Who are the population in iSPY? It's women with locally advanced breast cancer. They are being assigned standard therapy as a comparator to an intervention which incorporates a novel therapy, and the outcome is pathologic complete response. What's important about the iSPY trial is it's a really unique design that uses something called adaptive randomization. What does that exactly mean? It means the trial is meant to adapt to a signal. So if we all have a biogenomic uh, signature that says half of you have a triple negative cancer and half of your signature is HER2 positive and then another half, so that's three halves, have hormone positive disease, okay? <laughs> If all of you enter a trial that's randomly assigned to standard versus standard plus, but somewhere along the lines we find out, oh my goodness, everyone who's responded had a triple negative signature. The design of this trial adapts to that so that women going forward with that signature get that drug. So that's adaptive randomization. And there are multiple drugs that are being evaluated and we found some things out. So in San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, we found out that if you compare carboplatin to a PARP inhibitor plus carboplatin in women with a triple negative genomic signature, you can almost double the pathologic complete response. We've also learned that if you compare the HER2 and epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitor, naritinib, with docetaxel, 
you can double the pathologic response specifically in women with HER2 hormone receptor negative genomic signatures. Adaptive randomization, signals are being identified. We can streamline trials to see if this holds up. This is not the only trial you need to know about. There are, th there are trials that are, that are being launched by the National Cancer Institute called the Umbrella Studies or BASKET trials, which doesn't look at patients being enrolled based on what tumor they have. The enrollment is based on what is the genomic mutation we identify. They are looking at the use of integral biomarkers, which means they're looking at patients specifically for entry into a trial so that they can put them into a specific trial pathway. They're looking at integrated biomarkers, which are the markers that show pathways are actually activated and being impacted. And they're also using these basket trials to ask just very fundamental descriptive questions which are called the exploratory biomarkers. The aim of them are to streamline these trials by saying we have thousands of drugs, we're gonna, be, we're gonna make a master protocol where arms can come in and come out based on activity seen or not. It's to help streamline what we need to go through to bring you trials in each cancer center. And it allows us to, again, modify trial design without starting from ground point zero. The point is this, and again, this is a nice segue from Dr. Barun's talk. It's to get us from the point of treating all as the same to identifying how we're different and putting those with similar differences into trials that make sense. And this is gonna be a really important way for us to go forward. This is the schema of the NCI match trial, or NCI um, clinical trial. Everyone starts with genetic sequencing. Um, if a mutation is found, they go forward. Here, they get a study drug. If you have stable disease, you can get a holiday. If you respond, you continue, continue, continue. And if you progress, we check for additional mutations. And if another one is found, you go back in. And if you do not have a mutation, you're off study. You come off and you come back and you get hopefully another clinical trial or you get offered standard drugs. The impact trial is the molecular profiling for the assessment of clinical treatment. It's going to take that question and go one step, one big step backwards. It's asking the fundamental question. If we use molecular information, are we actually going to improve outcomes? It's a really important question. The design is two forks in the road. So you have a mutation, you're either gonna get randomly assigned to treatment plus targeted or treatment without targeted therapy. And the way they've decided to design the study so it's palatable for everyone, including your doctors, is that if you get assigned to the arm without targeted treatment and you do not do well, you will get the targeted treatment later. Okay, so it's the MPAC trial. The population, patients with metastatic or advanced disease, um, very different from, say, the iSPY trial. These trials are not only changing the way we design studies, but there are challenges for me, for those of us in cancer centers who do clinical research, but also for patients. Because, again, 80% of our trials don't succeed because of enrollment issues. Either we can't find patients, you're not offered trials, or we screen thousands of people and only two people are eligible. The other issue is this, why aren't more people eligible for these trials? Because there's still much more we need to find out about molecular profiling. We are still evolving in that way. This whole bunch of gray represents 38% of genes that are maybe mutated, but go uncharacterized. So not everybody who enters for consideration of these clinical trials will be able to enroll, because at this point, we may not be able to detect what's called an actionable mutation. And beyond just the scientific reasons, we must worry about financial toxicity. It's a real problem with our approved drugs and is likely to get worse as newer 
targeted therapies are developed. Can the patient afford these treatments? Can society afford to cover them? I recall a conversation with an insurance, um, uh, someone at Blue Cross in Rhode Island once when Abraxane became approved and met with them to get Abraxane for our patients. And his quote to me was, it's not that we can't do it, we can certainly give Abraxane, but that money's gonna come from somewhere. So would you rather it come from the vaccination program or the screening program? These are hard choices that society does need to make, and we need to make them, we need to be a part of that conversation. Because it comes down to this question, how much is a life worth? For me, for us, for women like Christina, my friend, and for Lisa, I think we would have moved mountains to be here today, you know, and to survive, to see our children grow up, to hit 70 and die of that heart attack waiting for us sometime in the, in the future. So we must never stop pushing for what we want and what we can do better because your lives are at stake, our friends' lives are at stake, and our mother's lives are at stake. And it was too late for Christina, um, whose cancer journey lasted two years. Um, she had an incredibly aggressive hormone positive breast cancer. I was fortunate because I was able to see her the week before she died. But she is my motivation for being on this stage with YSC, and she is my motivation for why um, I'm still in research, and she is my motivation why I'm going to try to provide you with hope because we are improving outcomes for women after breast cancer, in fact, cancer alone. These improvements will come on the heels of our clinical trials. So you as advocates, as patients, are critical in that process. You need to look for trials to see if you're eligible. You need to demand input on how we're designing those trials. And we need to engage, and you need to help us engage with industry to ensure that when that drug is approved, we can actually afford it. We must demand better access for funding and clinical trials. We need to access all patients who are eligible, regardless of race, of economic class, of education. And we need to really um, petition the FDA for access to these drugs. We must work collaboratively. We must push for funding for smarter trials and patient engagement because cancer is not a death sentence. You are living longer than you were in the past, although there's only one of you. Um, but precision, personalized therapy, is an important goal for all of us. So with that, I'll close. So thank you very much.